I'm Byron Akahito. I'm editor-in-chief for a website called lastwatchdog.com that follows uh, security, cybersecurity, I should say, issues and privacy. Uh, I've been writing about the topic as a journalist for uh, about 14 years. Uh, most of that time at USA Today, it's uh, what, I couldn't have picked a better topic in terms of uh, you know, richness and impact. Uh, security, privacy touches everything we do in our digital lives that we live today. So um, <clears throat> this notion of uh, digital breadcrumbs. So what do we do? We tromp through our daily lives, leaving digital footprints everywhere we go. And along the way, we're dropping all these crumbs. Well, these crumbs are bits of personal information about our preferences, where we go online, well, how much time we spent there, which computer we do it from, even which browser we're doing it from. So no surprise that it's possible to build behavior profiles from these rather, actually, rather powerful, uh, rather detailed behavior profiles. And in the most obvious example is an attempt to the attempt to use it for behavior modification. Anybody use Amazon or Netflix? That's what they've been doing for a long time and continue to push the edge of the envelope there. Um, so, but what we'd like to focus on today, because that's a huge topic, right? We'd like to focus on the workplace and protecting employees. So, um, that'll narrow it down a little bit and, um, what do we mean by that? Well, if you just think about it, if you can, you can create behavior profiles, you can kind of pigeonhole people in a way, maybe even predict certain behaviors and then take action based on that uh, analysis. And this is not directly a workplace issue, but the Parkland shooting, right? They had 23 data points reports through the sheriff's office, uh, escalating reports about uh, the accused shooter uh, showing signs that he might do this behavior. And then they had two YouTube, or a YouTube digital breadcrumb that was pretty stunning, uh, that was taken to the FBI and sort of ignored twice. And just right now, we, there's a bombing going on, or there's bombings going on here, right in Austin. So I would say it's a safe bet there are probably digital uh, breadcrumbs that uh, will be investigated. Um, and if we could turn the clock back, maybe even they could have used it predictively. So that's, a, that's kind of the framework of where we'd like to take this panel discussion. And uh, I have the privilege of uh, introducing the two panelists here. You, you're, you're fortunate that you showed up here because you have two really terrific panelists who are well-versed in this, well-qualified uh, to discuss the context of behavior profiling in the workplace and even to dissect it for you and, and hopefully you'll leave here with a few things that are useful and will be helpful to you uh, going forward. Um, anybody here uh, in the HR field? One, two, three, four, oh, that's good. Well, that's a, <laughs> it's, you're, you're a high, high percentage of the audience. <laughs> so um, it's my privilege to my right here, I'd like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Rogers. She's a private attorney, uh, also a native Texan from somewhere, uh, Texas is a big state, but you're near somewhere in this neck of the woods, right? Um, she specializes in privacy and data security, and she has a distinction of being the first chief privacy officer in state government in the great state of Texas. And to Elizabeth's right, is Matt Moynihan, he's the Chief Executive Officer at Forcepoint, which is a leading information security company that happens to be at the forefront of behavioral systems. So let's dive right into it and let the experts uh, inform you here. So I'd like to begin with Matt on the, f on the far right here. And um, Matt, maybe you could help kind of frame behavioral monitoring in the workplace. What Can you kind of set the table for us on what we're discussing here? Yeah, sure. Um, 
You know, there's, there's a continuum. Um, on one end, I would say on the left, Byron, uh, of surveillance, right, where I think you, you have some sort of association, I guess, historically with governments or nation states. Um, as you move to the to the right, uh, you hear the term monitoring uh, quite a bit. Um, and then to the farther right, the other end of the continuum, uh, protection. Um, they all use very similar technologies. Right? Governments have obviously been in the business of monitoring people for long periods of time, uh, trying to protect nation state interests. Um, you've seen perhaps that technology uh, become almost perfected uh, to some extent, some elements of the technology perfected by folks like Google and Facebook, who have tried to uh, understand their consumer bases uh, with high degrees of accuracy. Uh, oftentimes, I talk to chief security uh, officers inside of private companies, and they'll routinely say that the uh, Facebooks and Googles of the world know their employees and locations and patterns better than they do. Um, and uh, you move a little bit farther to right, there are banks that use technologies to understand their customers uh, to prevent fraud. Um, if you've ever been on a bank call, they'll oftentimes uh, let you know that they may be recording this call. Uh, in many cases, they'll take a snippet of your voice to understand you when you call back in and uh, do very specific one-to-one -one customer support. And, um, and so and these technologies have been around for, for quite some time. And uh, what's very exciting now uh, is that they're being brought into the workplace uh, to really understand uh, employee uh, behavior patterns uh, for the purposes of not just providing more cybersecurity, uh, in many cases around uh, intellectual property theft and critical data uh, leakage, uh, but in the extreme cases uh, around preventing uh, workplace violence, uh, active shooters, uh, radicalization of employees. And so um, the thing we have to be uh, very cognizant of is that this technology is extremely powerful. Um, and the relationship uh, between employer and employee and that social contract is a fundamentally different one than with a Google and, and Facebook and their uh, customers or a bank and their customers and even a nation state with their, with their uh, citizens. So uh, it's, new, it's new ground, but the, uh, the art of the possible is quite exciting. So, so Elizabeth, Elizabeth, could you address that, that shift that uh, Matt's describing where we're going from just company to consumer and now it's employee, employer, and you, you work with the employer, so maybe you could set the table there for us. What, what's the employer point of view on this? Sure, so the dynamic is much more different. The morale is a, a heightened concern. Productivity of the employee, trust between the employee and the employer is significant. Um, so in this context, when the trigger is about to be pulled for any type of monitoring activity, and many of you already are familiar with drug testing, alcohol testing as a form of monitoring for safety, we now move into the technology um, area. And the two, you know, anytime there is some type of monitoring for safety, it's going to implicate the twin concern of privacy for the employee. And so in the United States, there are two main restrictions on this activity that protects the workforce, and that is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and then, of course, the age-old common law. Um, and all of those, and in Europe now, in about 73 days, we will be uh, all looking toward the EU for enforcement of the General Data Protection Regulations. All those laws preserve the employee trust in the employer because it requires the employer to have a legitimate business interest. So the same old test that, that provided the foundation for monitoring last century is the one that is helping the monitoring in this century. So we, we, talked, we talked at lunch about what, what position that pu uh, pu puts the employer in. They actually, this is to Elizabeth, they actually have to uh, kind of think about the, the risk or the cost of, you know, pushing forward on privacy or, or you know, getting more nosy on their employees for good reason, right? you know, to protect safety. Right. So I think part of preserving that contract, too, is helping the employee and the, the third-party contractors, in fact, believe it's for their safety and for their own well-being. And, in fact, 
provide all the notices that are possible, establish the foundation by first of all creating a policy that says you care about workplace violence. Um, it's not going to be very legitimate that you are claiming workplace violence is the reason for your monitoring if you don't even have a policy right that prevents that or protects the employee. Also policies for all other workplace misconduct that is being monitored such as um, identity theft, theft of um, intellectual property for whatever reason the monitoring is going on but especially workplace violence make sure there's transparency establishing a, a foundation for the monitoring notice that the monitoring is going to occur when it's going to occur how it's going to occur and why and make sure it's limited to the purpose stated so, so matt there there is um even though we're very early in this shift there is already a best practices sort of frame that uh, is out there. You guys have talked about it quite a bit. Could you address that? Uh, well, as far as uh, the privacy elements of it, um, you know, I, would, I might go so far to say that um, privacy is almost gone in today's digital age. Let's put workplace aside for a second. I mean, we routinely are clicking on end user license agreements and giving away information. And I think that's one of the big challenges. Uh, there's more information on you out there than you probably even realize. And so I think, um, uh, some of the best practices that we've tried to put in uh, inside of companies, uh, in addition to um, disclosure to employees, um, you know, these digital technologies are so interesting because you can be as transparent or not transparent as you want to be. It's an interesting word, right? Um, you can be completely open and disclose things or not at all. And so what we have tried to do is, again, first step is to disclose what you're doing, right, uh, why you're doing it. Um, and then really focus on doing it um, correctly. Um, right now, most organizations, ironically, are, um, I don't want to say discriminating, it sounds like a strong word, but everyone is monitoring some element of their workforce. And uh, as opposed to what you might think of gender or race or some of their biases that enter into the workforce, some of the discrimination that comes with monitoring is really more associated with job code. Uh, give you an example, um, traders inside of banks uh, are routinely monitored. Uh, they know they're being monitored when they get hired to join that bank, and it's just part of the contract. Uh, individuals who have security clearances get monitored routinely. So the first one is not to provide bias in who you're monitoring. Uh, we actually recommend monitor everybody equally. And then on top of that, make sure that you really um, control the release of identity with that data. Uh, monitoring is one thing, but it can all be done completely confidentially and uh, and ensure that there's a chain of custody around who gets access to that identity. Well, what's an, what's an example of that, Matt? Well, example for me, for instance, um, you know, I'm monitored at work. We use our own technologies. It's for the purpose of, um, you know, two things, really, workplace uh, violence uh, and also uh, intellectual property protection. Um, but for me, for instance, obviously, because I'm CEO of the company, um, I want to make sure that the only people that see my information, if I were to do something that was bad, are ones that would have a legitimate right to that information because it was probably uh, putting employees at risk or crossing a law. So in my particular case, uh, the head of HR, uh, the general counsel, and then the chairman of the board are the only ones that could get a uh, access to my information. Well, that, that's also protecting the company in that if too many, you can get a lower level party that doesn't really know how to interpret the information correctly and then absolutely so you know, get out of control pretty quickly yeah, in the case of HR it might be a um, you know a, a functional manager right that may not have the 360 purview around how to assess that information right it may require a more senior uh, seasoned executive um, in the security case uh, in an incident response you wouldn't want a junior analyst to get access to my information that could interpret a piece of information my behavior as a CEO looks very different when I'm traveling around the world if I look like a hacker to some, <laughs> some extent accessing the systems at various hours, uh, then it would be a, 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 you know, a, a local employee, for instance. So you, know, um, you can monitor and do it in a completely um, you know, protective way where identity is protected unless something crosses a legal issue or a issue where someone looks so agitated that they could go and you know, uh, harm someone physically. So uh, maintaining the privacy associated with identity is, to me, more important in today's world than it is around whether you're monitoring or not. Uh, Elizabeth, what are you hearing from some of your clients in terms of the big, you know, the clear and present issues they have to deal with in, 
in, in doing more monitoring or even thinking about doing more monitoring of their employees? I think it's more a matter of evolution than it is the question of whether monitoring is appropriate. So the, we, many of us have been subject to HIPAA ever since it was passed. And that particular law, um, in the context of the employment world, you know, also relies on the concept of only those having a need to know, or the same thing under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We've all sort of been acculturated to protect health information automatically, and only those who have a managerial responsibility with the need to know that data um, has it. So that goes toward continuing the trust between employer and employee now, however, um, ever since the internet entered into the workforce, we find all forms of uh, behavior occurring online, whether it's somebody using state government resources to have a uh, massage uh, business on the side in their apartment. You know, do, does the Fourth Amendment allow us to monitor that employee's behavior outside of the workplace, all the way up to um, cyber threats and cyber terrorism and what, you know, how far can the employer go in watching the behavior? What behavior is appropriate? That is the questions I'm getting now is can we watch their internet behavior all at all times or do we only look at people who are visiting sites on how to make bombs? So that's the question. Yeah. And technically, uh, Matt, as you pointed out, there, there is no privacy. Te Technology-wise, what, what's possible? I set you up on yeah, that well, one. Most people would be shocked, you know, <laughs> what, what is out there on the open internet about them, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you know, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's probably all you need to, to really do harm to someone. I mean, most employers today will routinely go to, you know, uh, the glass door or look Facebook uh, from time to time. I, I know half the companies I have worked for in the past had go check out uh, your various online presence. So, again, I know in some states that's allowed or, 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 or not allowed. So. I would say that you know, really anything's possible. Now, and this whole notion of online and offline is completely blurred, right? And so to me, the question is um, uh, not so much around what's possible technically, but it's really around the, um, the um, effort by an employer to try to pr uh, determine context, right? You can have a black and white picture, a color picture, or technicolor, right? Technicolor would come from ingesting data sources like um, you know, credit scores, or trying to determine personal stressors that could give someone uh, a reason to do harm at work. So, so a credit score would tell you, you know, what somebody's under pressure low, of some low sort? Low credit scores, um, you could have uh, missed mortgage payment, uh, you could have, uh, you know, ironically, uh, Western Union wire transfers, right? Uh, nothing really good comes when, comes when people are using Western Union wire transfers, right? When you think about it, it's usually an emergency, it's a family issue, I need to get money to someone quickly. So there's all sorts of ways you can paint a picture around someone's current state. Um, that, that's one thing that we have to be very careful of. Would you feel comfortable with your employer monitoring your credit or mortgage payment history? Mm -hmm. um, you can take it even to the other end of the spectrum, which is trying to determine predisposition to certain events. Right? As you mentioned, you know, if you look at the uh, Parkland, Florida shooting case, or if you look at the San Bernardino workplace violence event, um, there were various um, you know, signals or signs that uh, would have t potentially tipped somebody off that this particular person or persons uh, may have a reason, whether it be mental illness or other uh, or, or uh, uh, political affiliation, to do harm. And I think that's, that's the challenge, that the Internet is anonymous. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you know, the question for not just employers but anyone really is, you know, do is a black and white picture good enough, right? Or are you going to go to color and then detect in color? Because that's sort of what Google, Facebook, and Amazon do to understand their consumer bases. They do it quite effectively. You can do that in the workplace, but uh, it will come at the risk of uh, you know impairing you know, potential the culture of your organization if you're not careful, even though mm -hmm. it may be allowable under law. And, and again, I think Matt is exactly right. There, there's all possibilities of where you can go, and, and it's only not allowed in the workplace if you haven't provided notice. As long as you provide fair transparency, who's going to see the information, what will be done with it. For example, all of us, most of us have been through a criminal background check or an employee background check, right? We all have become used to that. 
And, and sometimes they're looking for criminal behavior in the past, and often it may have been you know, a small misdemeanor. But because we've already been accustomed to that mentality of communicating to our potential workforce in our current workforce, you've got to pass this. Now you go that one step further and say we will be monitoring behavior for any substantial or material um, departure from acceptable conduct, including criminal behavior, and make them aware that whether it's credit, um, you just disclose everything that will be collected, uh, make sure there's some legitimate business interest in case there ever is a claim brought against you either in the U.S. or under the, the new GDPR. And as long as you have that basis in, on audit proof that you've communicated, you can go all those places. Could you give us an example, a real example without naming names, of, of companies or organizations that are doing that at the leading, what, are, what, what types of things are they monitoring? at this point. Well, I know Matt <laughs> has dealt with some of the largest companies in the world and probably the federal government contractors like Boeing and some of the others that actually have need security clearances. So they go a lot further and I'm going to defer to you Matt. On well yeah I think it's, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of the technologies are already in the workplace. So for instance um, there was an article recently in The Economist t talking about how employers were going to use artificial intelligence to um, help uh, uh, inexperienced managers determine when their employees were going to leave. And it was hmm. all under the guise of employee engagement. And so literally, these algorithms were going through and reading everybody's emails, right? Sounds like spying to some extent. And looking for, you know, sentiment and emotion and keywords that would suggest uh, someone's uh, looking for a job. For, for retention and, purposes. And for retention purposes, right? <laughs> wow. And so um, it's, a, it's already out there. It's already yeah. being used. So I think the... Um, you know, some of the more sophisticated cases um, that are being discussed are things around if you have something, um, a government regulation like Foreign Corrupt, uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, right, which basically says uh, bribery uh, should not be conducted in, in, in the business world. Um, uh, today, in, in a physical world, you would go look at like expense uh, reports and see if there's receipts and look for funky things that are happening in the channel. But in the digital world, you know, how do you figure that out? Well, you read email, right? Mm -hmm. Or you look for keywords that might be, uh, so there's Dot a whole, are you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So there's a whole continuum of things. So when you think about the communication channels, that's really where um, companies are trying to grasp, um, uh, you know, uh, web communication, chat, uh, email, um, you know, all corporate, uh, corporate given communication channels with, you know, corporate given laptops and, and devices are one thing. I think where the line is um, being drawn right now is monitoring uh, communication over your personal email at work, right? right? Or turning on cameras at, on PCs at home, even though you know somebody's stealing something or doing, there's all sorts of, you know, in court of law where the lines Could, get couldn't you put that in, couldn't you put that in the employment contract we will I mean like you said well, I'm just being double in the yeah. policy I mean that, I mean that brings up a good point so all of the policies that you have in your whatever you call it your intranet employee handbook paper version just needs to um, make it clear that the no company resource, there's no expectation of privacy in the use of any company resource, whether you're using it for personal email, signing your child up for camp this summer, entering their social security number or your credit card number to pay for it, or applying for a Quicken loan before the interest rates rise. All of these are items that will be, you know, part of the discussion, the dialogue between the employee and the employer. And um, just backpedaling a little bit to the fact that you know there may not be privacy in the on the internet anymore, but in the employment area there is still some expectation. Absolutely. So that's where it comes yeah. um, from our you know our responsibility to provide that notice. And as the European Union becomes closer across the pond to the U.S. and acculturates our global companies in Houston and Austin and other uh, major cities, there will be that that um, attention to cr making sure privacy remains. But again, it's it all goes back to the notice, the transparency, and the legitimate business purpose. And just one, yeah, one of the things that I think is interesting is most cybersecurity issues come down to, not just cybersecurity, most of security comes down to um, preventing impersonation. So when you think about check writing and, and forgery, 
Uh, you think about um, uh, some of the scams against the elderly online, right? Or you think about uh, impersonating a board member, right? Phishing. So 80% of uh, uh, most of the infrastructure breaches, people getting into companies around their cybersecurity, come from abused identities, right? Half of all breaches don't even use malware anymore. So to me, the interesting thing is, you know, how do you use monitoring to protect identities of people? And so well, much right. like workplace uh, violence, but there's so many good ways you can do by positively affirming that. Well, you, you might be behavior profiling to, to spot somebody who might be violent, but while you're doing that behavior profiling, you have a pattern of your good employees and what they look like it's a, when they're all, doing the job. We all have habits, you know. Uh, you know, I go to uh, ESPN, Wall Street Journal, and CNN every day, you know, no matter where I am on the planet, sometimes multiple times a day. If I don't go there, on a particular day, it's a high it's not degree you. <laughs> of probability it's not me. <laughs> you go right? So if you, look at the, if you look at the election hack, right, um, you know, someone tricking someone into giving credentials to email. So the, the, the behavioral patterns of human beings should be the greatest asset. Now, you do get into the slippery slope of, um, you know, uh, of uh, privacy. But I personally think, you know, what's going to be more interesting is, you know, what will employees do in the confines of work uh, to help their cybersecurity practitioners get more effective in their job. And so if you're willing to give up a lot of privacy with Google and Facebook for a lightweight app, right, or convenience, uh, I'd, I'd be willing to let people monitor me if I could actually prevent, you know, uh, not just uh, active shooters, that's just the extreme of it, but you know, cyber bullying, right? There's so much that goes on uh, over, over electronic media that, um, you know, if we're willing to give it up on the consumer side, why wouldn't we be able to you know, participate almost crowdsource uh, a better work environment. Now, again, every company's got to pick their line in that continuum because at the end of the day, it comes down to culture, mm -hmm. and you choose the company you want to work for. And if you don't, if you if you get it wrong, you may very well have a workplace engagement issue for sure. Yeah, it kind of goes back. You mentioned earlier someone did um, drug testing, so that kind of brings you back to that. That's what you know. When did drug testing become mandatory? That kind of blew by me, you know? Well, you know, here's an interesting but, example. One of my previous employers, right, uh, uh, marijuana now is legal in some states. Yeah. Right, this company, prior to this whole movement happening, uh, had uh, drug testing mandatory. And it, it, they did a lot of, a lot of their workers, um, you know, operated vehicles and machinery, so it made perfect sense. But you had employees in certain states where marijuana was now legal, and they kept the drug testing. Right, and uh, one of the areas was Berkeley, California, right? And so, you know, that became, a, it went from being a legal to a cultural issue overnight, mm -hmm. right? And some of the employees end up opting out because they don't want to work for a company that was gonna do mandatory test, drug testing even though it was legal, and they could do it in their personal life. Now, the company was doing it because of the machinery issue. You don't want people operating machinery at work, but it's a fine line, right, between legal and illegal and culture and, uh, and uh, you know, not a culture you want to work for. Elizabeth, what well, do you think this is going? So I think the same thing, and I think now we've, as we have been discussing, it's gone from manual drug testing to you know employee background t checks to now monitoring on a on a regular basis. So the the line somewhere may be just depending on your culture and what your the company tolerates and what the workforce tolerates. Instead of continuous monitoring of internet behavior, perhaps block certain sites instead of watching everywhere they're going, right? Like if you don't want them to go to Google, which my employer will not allow us to do, we cannot use our Gmail at work. Um, Interesting. Um, you know, just block it. And then also, like for example, if you know there are certain sites that are, that are illegal, then you have it in your policy and then you have a, a DLP uh, solution that says, you are about to violate the policy against so-and-so and ask permission, do you really want to violate this versus uh, later on forgiveness? So there's ways to, to accomplish all the objectives, protecting the privacy of w what behavior is being monitored online and achieving that security. Well, let's talk about that for a second because all these added pressures you're adding to the employee for the privilege of working at my organization. Well, let's talk about morale. Can, can this be done in a way that doesn't hurt morale, maybe enhances morale? I mean, it seems like there would be a risk of 
like you said, I'm not going to work here because... Yeah, we do. So at uh, Force Point, we use our own technology. Uh, and so we uh, really erred on the side of being very, very open and transparent. Right? Um, the only thing we hold back is some of the techniques that we do it because if you were a insider threat or a terrorist or someone who's... You could who's, bypass. You, you could bypass it, right? So, but as far as policies on what we look for, it's really all the same things in the physical world and the digital world. You know, if you're going to steal corporate assets and you're going to do it digitally instead of walking out with a file, you know... With the Rubik's Snowden. Cube. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, in most people... It, it, actually, what I found is if you, if you do it right and you roll out the program uh, uh, proactively, um, you actually get some culture points for it. Um, and, uh, and people more often than not are willing to sacrifice for the greater good. I mean, it's, it, it, it sounds crazy, but, um, you know, people are willing to do that as long as they know they're being respected and not, um, and not abused in, in that Doesn't process. it generally sort of raise uh, cyber hygiene awareness, sort of cyber, the culture, it tends to support well, you that. Know the interesting thing with some of this stuff is that, um, you know, security historically has all been around trying to think of every bad thing that can happen and stopping everyone from doing it, okay? The power of where we're going at the security uh, company uh, and where the market is going is almost a cybersecurity of one, right? If you know, um, so for instance, I went to, uh, this is a true story, I came back from a, a long trip and I had to pay my homeowner's insurance. I had 24 hours to do it because I was overseas and I was stressed. Tried to do it, and my own technology blocked me from entering my credit card into my own homeowner's insurance, right? And I was pretty frustrated. Uh, called up the security team and said, "We got a product problem." And they said, "No, you don't, uh, sir. Uh, it's it's meant to do that. I said, it's meant to frustrate me." <laughs> because, <laughs> the CEO. You know, be careful what you wish for, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I said, "No, it's a, it's a it's a product issue." And he said, "No." I, I said, yeah, "Well, we have to change this." And he said, "I'll change it for you." And I said, "That's the wrong answer too, because." I'm just talking to you over the phone. You know, we haven't, you don't know if it's really me. And so, but if it had known that it was me, if it had known it was my personally identifiable information and not a customer's identifiable information that should not go outside of the four walls, if they knew it was my homeowner's insurance website, which if you were to go look up who that is, you can find it publicly, right? You would have let me go, right? And so that's the power, right? Um, security has been a, uh, a point of friction inside the workplace for so long. And as soon as you have points of friction, people, smart people, uh, will get around it. Mm -hmm. And so I think the power is to flip the model on its head and get to know the individual as much as you possibly can while respecting their identity in the process to, you know, free uh, organizations from friction. If you do that thing right, I think, I think it could be pretty powerful. And I, I think, again, also just to prevent it from eliminating morale, make it a personal issue among your in workforce. In other words, if they believe their own personal data is at risk, then they start to believe the company's assets are at risk and their, um, their behavior is being monitored for the good of the whole. One other item we, we instituted when I was internal was um, there was seven core competencies for review and we established an eighth one, which is information security and privacy awareness so that it was part of everyone's annual review. If they did good things, if they cooperated, if they, um, if they saw something, they said something, then they got uh, points at the end of the year during their review. If they were sloppy, they, they went, they violated policies, they tried to create shortcut, download peer uh, sharing files, they got uh, a, a penalty. So it, if it becomes a part of the culture, I think it becomes, it, it lessens the impact on the morale. And, and humans are an average, right? But, you know, most security systems treat them that way. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if you were to take my parents, I mean, they're clearly not as technically, you know, uh, articulate or facile as, you know, the millennials that are out mm -hmm. there, right? But cyber training isn't going to stop them from doing it, right? So if you actually knew them and knew that they weren't, uh, uh, if, they, if they weren't good at security, then how would you treat them under when you're under attack? You might think differently, right? You'd actually maybe remind them, hey, do you really want to attach this to the email because there's a phishing attack going on, mm -hmm. right? And so I think this, uh, I do think this personalization can be used uh, for good uh, in many, many ways, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, obviously abuse cases, which I think would be the would be the French. Mm -hmm. Well, so it's almost like uh, aim for, you know, aim the target at preventing violence in the workplace, but along every step you go along the, toward that path, 
benefits to your company if you do it correctly, yeah, if you think the, about morale. You think the unfortunate, unfortunate case with the recent uh, shooter in Florida where the FBI, I guess, was, uh, you know, uh, by public accounts, the FBI was uh, given some clues to that. This is a true story uh, from a company I was in, and I get access to this. I don't get involved in everything, but I see a lot inside of a company. There was an email thread going around uh, where um, an employee was agitated Okay, and um, agitated to the point where three or four people uh, issued complaints to HR, and uh, basically said this person's agitated, angry, you know, not not uh, not uh, acting you know, appropriate with our culture at the company. And I saw an email exchange between HR and general counsel, and the general counsel actually knew this individual, and said, um, "Oh, that's so and so. They're just a little bit of a grumpy type of person, and you know, whatever." Now, it's interesting, right? I mean, you could be dismissive of that, mm -hmm. right? Or that person could have really had external stressors or, or whatever stressors on them to actually take that to the next level. So that information shouldn't go without being registered. Now, what should have happened, it would have been interesting, I think, to take that information and append it to a profile and maybe have an email go around to the management team saying, hey, just as an FYI, without telling the person, there's somebody in the company who's agitated. You don't have to tell you who it is. You don't want people to judge their behavior before they come in, but just keep just you know keep your eye open, right? And if that happens, report it. And if it's if after that awareness, the reports come in that it is the same person, then you have an issue, mm -hmm. right? And so I think these digital breadcrumbs are really really powerful. Again, as long as the privacy is respected, mm -hmm. um, and that comes in very form. But I don't think I think we're at the stage now when you've seen with San Bernardino or the Florida shooters. Um, you know, di cyber digital is now either the attack ground, as you saw with the various elections, or it's the planning ground for physical attacks. And even if you look at some of the terrorist attacks, uh, unfortunate over in the UK, where a, a physical person gets in a physical car, runs over physical people on a physical bridge, mm -hmm. it's all planned digitally, mm -hmm. right? And so this, l this blurred line uh, between physical and digital has uh, completely gone away. And if you look at the physical security, market, and it's about a $120 billion market a year, okay? And it's all being digitized, mm -hmm. you know, IP enabled. So you are starting to see badges being tracked inside of companies, uh, video cameras now being stored just like you would a physical document. And so uh, I think we're in the very early innings uh, of what this is, but it's not just around uh, cyber monitoring. I think you're going to start seeing, uh, uh, you know, all the monitoring that took place in banks and, you know, mm -hmm. various... Uh, physical monitoring systems being fused with cyber so that you'll ultimately be able to see the flow of risk across the physical world and yeah. the digital world. Well, things like Parkland and perhaps this, even the one that's happening here, I mean, that just like gives you the, some uh, proving ground, if you will, for law enforcement anyway, to try and work with some of these tools or yeah. see how they can incorporate them into their law enforcement. Companies have to look at it a little more microscopically having to do with you know, their vertical industry and what they're doing internally, but it's very powerful stuff, uh, but delicate, right? I think well, we're talking about is. all these issues on how hard it is to actually use it well. Because I think part of the chain of command and the life cycle of all these breadcrumbs has to also be on who is finally accountable and responsibility responsible for what is done with the breadcrumbs. So if they do, if the employer is monitoring breadcrumbs for workplace violence, ultimately it, it needs to be turned over to law enforcement, right? That law enforcement should be the ones that look at the breadcrumbs and decide, is this person a person of interest? Should we take this person into custody? So clearly we, the employers have the power, the very incredible power that Matt speaks to, but it has to be managed responsibly and given to those who are properly accountable for well, what ultimate decision is made. And that also continues to um, it, you know, create the trust between the employer and the employee. They know the employer is not going to be taking action without uh, evidence that there's something criminal. I actually think you're going to see employees and employers like, uh, mandate it. You know, I was, on a, I was uh, in a conference the other day, and someone asked, after this Experian or Equifax hack took place, I said, what's the problem with all these hacks going on? And one of my panelists said, um, oh, you know, the internet wasn't built with security in mind, right? Which, you know, you hear that quite a bit. And I said, they asked me if I agreed. And I said, I agree, but not so much, right? I think the problem was the internet was built on trust. Okay, in the, in the physical world, you, you're brought up not to trust people, right? <laughs> it's like, well, look people in the eye, you know, don't mm -hmm. talk to strangers. 
in an absent of the physical uh, connectivity, you look for various institutions, police, firemen, uh, you know, what have you. In the absence of that, you look to brands. That's what, you know, people spend so much money in advertising, right? The market capitalization of trusted brands is three times that of the number two provider. And so on and so on. That's where you have the, the, the crisis in the church and all these institutions and government that are now. So I think the internet um, was built on trust by academics who trusted everybody. And the physical tells that existed in the physical world don't exist in the digital world. Given how these things have completely blurred, I don't know how you could ever have a security paradigm that didn't monitor for the purposes of workplace safety, right? As too much happens on there and you have so much anonymity that um, I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to go mainstream. And I think the, the, the seminal issue over the next decade is going to be around respecting the identity of those you're monitoring to the point where you're being transparent and you're not um, mm -hmm. mis mis misusing mm -hmm. it. And at the end of the day, if you did, aside from any um, legal violations or regulatory violations, I mean, people will leave your company. Good people will leave your company if that trust is that, breached. That'll get people's attention. Yeah. Um, one more, uh, let me open this up. Last question here before we open up to questions to the audience. So how would, uh, and we'll start with Elizabeth, could you just mind? So the big, hairy issue that's right on the horizon, companies are going to run into it, workers are going to run into it, employees. What, Elizabeth, how, what, what sort of, how should uh, employers and employees think about this? Just what should they be thinking about? What's an approach or should they, you know, Worst thing is if you just ignore it and then it hits you in the face one of these days because you run into yeah. it, right? I think that the millennials have helped to answer that question, and that is to think as a socially responsible citizen, as a corporation. And to be a member of a so socially responsible corporation, um, I think the most successful companies, no matter what industry in this century, are going to be those who are the most responsible with the multiple millions of records that we are generating and how we're analyzing them, and whether it's for workplace violence and otherwise. And I heard one of the most powerful hashtags last week after the Florida bill was introduced, um, which is hashtag me next. And you can translate that from the school room to the workplace. And if we're not all responsible with protecting each other and submit to some security um, monitoring, then there will be that me next. It'll go, f it'll continue. So I think we all need to be socially responsible and partner with each other. Matt? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And I'd also say that um, when you look at companies, companies have their own rhythm and flow to how they behave. You know, if you were to go just sort of trace what happens in a company every day, there's people and then there's data. And if you were to step back, and you can, you can track both of them, and there's a regular rhythm to them, right? And so I think if you look at the continuum of, uh, of intent, it's so important to think about what intent is, right? Um, and, you know, the book ends, you know, the, there's an old saying, the uh, sad harm themselves and the mad harm others, right? Those are the physical workplace violence bookends, right? And they pale in comparison to anything else, right? Um, and, uh, but in between those two bookends, uh, there's a massive, massive IT security industry that's largely built around uh, protecting companies from data loss. Critical data loss, intellectual property, blueprints, you know, that's what most hackers try to get in. They don't just hang around inside, they try to get out with your data, right? And so, depending on what you're trying to do, I would have companies engage in a dialogue with their employees, you know, against the state that they're trying to protect folks from uh, physical violence, and if they do, be transparent around it, the tools we're using. If for some reason that's not the approach, uh, you can focus on the intellectual property thing by monitoring employees less and monitoring data more, right? Where is data going to? You know, who's sending it, who's receiving it, and not so much monitoring the behavior of an employee. Right. There's different technologies that focus more on controlling the flows of data than the people. And in, uh, in the most aggressive organizations in that continuum, hedge funds being an extreme example where hedge funds will monitor everything. They'll tell their employees they're monitoring everything, from physical cameras to cell phones to whatever. People, are, people take the job willingly and do that. To organizations that are a little bit um, uh, more concerned with that, those a little bit more progressive or, uh, you know, you might have a, 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 a 
pharmaceutical companies that have a lot of PhDs and doctors and scientists, they focus more on monitoring people less and monitoring data more, locking down data. And so when you bring those two things together, you can have a really powerful combination. But if you, uh, you know, depending on your culture, you may want to focus on one or the other more than the other, depending on who you are as a company. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. If uh, there's any questions here, I'm sure the panelists would be happy to take them. Go ahead. And if you could step to the mic so everybody can hear, I guess. So I actually have two questions. Uh, one of them is about machi machine learning. So a lot of the sessions I've been going to over the last several days have been talking about how we can utilize machine learning to really find the nuggets underneath the data that aren't obvious. And you, you spoke a lot, Elizabeth, about transparency. How have you guys started to think about how we can marry the transparency that would happen um, from an employer-employee contract about what is and isn't monitored and why to what machine learning may find that we may not be able to say, well, this is why I specifically found you. The machine told me I should be paying attention to this, so I did. Have you guys come across that already? Some of the startups that um, I have worked with are based on machine learning, and I think that the main thing along the continuum is the more sophisticated the technology is, the more granular the data is that can be realized about an individual just needs to be disclosed. And privacy policies can be amended as often as needed. They're not just annual uh, statements. So any time there is that evolution of discovery of more data, you just disclose it. That, that you are tracking it, you see it, this is what is being discovered about you. I don't know if anyone else has questions, so I'll keep going. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, second question is about, um, so when you switch companies, right, a lot of times you'll say, oh, I'm applying for this job, and here's a referral, here's someone you can call. Um, have you come across anybody wanting to transfer my digital breadcrumbs that were obtained at one employer mm -hmm. to then provide to another employer to say, she is someone mm -hmm. worth hiring, everything we have on file for her is pristine, or eh, she's a little sketch, you might want to pay more attention. Yeah, th those conversations, it's really fascinating, those conversations are starting to happen. And um, so when you think about it, and you think about a company, right, when a company hires somebody, and they do background checks largely for, you know, really extreme behavior, right, or, or, uh, or things you've done in your past, but every employee, every um, employee changes the risk profile of an enterprise or a company when they join, right? There's really sloppy, I mean, how many people have credit cards that they haven't shut down? They just like leave them open. Right now imagine all the passwords that are out there for LinkedIn, all the apps you used once and never shut them down, right? And so you could think about everybody has their own digital risk profile and so that could be good or it could be bad. Uh, I think you're gonna start seeing companies try to reduce their risk by showing employees when they join a company the risk that they're bringing in and to help them reduce the attack surface, hmm. right? You're not using these 15 apps that are out there. Why don't you just shut them down? I mean, you don't have to. It's your choice, but just did you know? That's all out there. It's all public information. Hmm. And so I think that's one yes. And we have had, you know, can we, um, can you port good behavior almost like a, a Yelp rating, right? Um, now what's interesting is companies are struggling with this because even like a financial services uh, uh, industry, um, they're trying to get down to behavior patterns by job code, right? Um, and they're doing it not so much for monitoring per se, but what they, they want to do is, uh, as employees move between companies, you know, someone that works at Goldman Sachs will then go to Morgan Stanley, will then go to, you know, can you apply a baseline pattern so that if that person is someone who's been uh, radicalized or is that person who has been someone who, uh, um, you know, uh, um, you know, they don't know, they have no history, you can apply a baseline risk profile for someone, let's say, in a call center or someone clearing a trade or something so that um, uh, across all banks, anyone in that job code would be applied sort of a, a digital safety net or some, some sort of, you know, security thing. So the whole concept of uh, a portable security score is definitely um, uh, being bantied about, um, but I think it'd be, uh, I think there could be a lot of benefits to the employee uh, or the employer, depending on how it, how it shakes out. Well, also, under the GDPR, there is now a data subject right to portability. So the working party um, 29 is still figuring out how much of the data may the employee take, what 
duty does the employer have? It, it goes along with the right to erasure as well. So if the personnel file has got nothing but tardies and um, absences, can you force the employer to erase all of that data? Um, that's, in, that's in Europe, by the way, just yes, for, right. to clarify. For, but for companies <laughs> who have servers in the U.S. and employees, even if they're not marketing to European citizens, the, the GDPR applies to the employees who are in Europe. So that is an excellent question, and American employers are going to have to, to find where that line is. And then finally, you know, because before digital um, tracking of employees, the main answer from an, a, a former employer was, here's her name, her title, and the salary she made. And now there's this entire digital file. What, how far do we go? Like, um, we were talking at lunch about the, the uh, what is it, the employee you said who wanted to find out everything in his personnel file no, and, right. and where he stood in the line of succession planning. Was he next? So there is a line. I think employers have to just be consistent with it and stay abreast of developments in the law. Well, I mean, but especially in the U.S. and the cultural difference, the, our view of, uh, you know, opt-in versus opt-out. I mean, Europe is completely different from how they're approaching that, as you just pointed out, with the, the rule for handling employee data. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, we still have a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I have a few questions, um, specifically around the forensic analytics that you're doing. It sounds to me like you're talking about doing it within the internet. And I know when I'm looking for a job, the last place I go on LinkedIn is going to be at the office. So it seems to me if I wanted to you know, build a bomb or something like that, the last place I would look into that would be at the office. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, um, with the mobile workforce and the new concept of BYOD, then how do you shut off what you're monitoring? when it becomes my personal information. Mm -hmm. Much like with insurance, you know, they want to know what my blood pressure is or my blood sugar level is, but they don't need to have a copy of what I discussed with my doctor either. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I had was kind of the Pandora's box things. Obviously, we've got BAFA going on right now, which is you must protect all of my personal data or pay a fine. In the scenario that Matt described, where the guy got the email that was illegal and said, oh, I know that guy is just whatever, and isn't there now a liability on the company because he didn't respond? Doesn't there have to be a paper trail? And does it become something the government now monitors whether or not you've responded? Hmm. Yes, yeah, so just um, I'll go through. So all these exist. I mean, what, what, what the analytics that we're doing, and, and, and it's a, a fast-growing part of the industry, end-user behavior analytics, it's just stitching together what once was fragmented information. Right? It's no different than, um, you know, you, you go to one, you switch doctors, and one doctor has incomplete history of you, and you, he, pres he or she uh, prescribes you a drug that you would have an allergic reaction to. It. They only know that information, right? And so I think the end-user behavior analytics is really stitching together a bunch of pieces of information to um, help you make a decision, not make the decision, help you make a decision. I think that's really important to the earlier question around machine learning is that you still need the human judgment in there at the end of the day, right? And the more machine learning you use, the less I would trust it. You know, it's, uh, machine learning is really good just for surfacing outliers or, or comparing data sets or something of that nature. Um, but um, to, go, to go to the first one, right, which, I th which I think was around, you know, where you would actually do something, right? You can get around any of this stuff. Right, I think where most employers, most employers, I would say almost all employers, other than maybe some of the most really sensitive intellectual property centric type of firms, like someone trying to steal, if someone stole a hedge fund trading algorithm, you're hosed, right? Because you can go replicate that tomorrow. You could go literally replicate a trillion dollar hedge fund overnight if you got that information. So there's extreme cases like that. But you know, uh, just like a, any bomber or anyone wanted to get around, you, you go to different places, right? You use different, you burner phones. Right, you, so companies really care more around what you're doing on corporate assets, you know, with systems that they're, they're, uh, they're uh, giving you as part of their work. Um, and I would say that goes for the mobile as well. Mobile is a little bit blurry because, you know, BYOD now is the de facto standard. It's a half of all enterprises now put corporate apps on personal phones, right? This was one of the biggest debates inside of my company, right? And so what my company has done, and I actually just came in line, and I'm a big privacy guy, um, you know, if you want the company to pay for your cell phone, 
then you have to use one of our corporate apps that will do things like allow you to kill the phone if you lose it or you know prevent you from going to certain websites, stuff like that. And so um, that's typically the way enterprises are, are doing it. Um, you can't control you know, some of this consumerization of IT, but you can't control whether you reimburse people. Right, and so there, you know, if you if you want to carry two phones, that's fine. <laughs> if you want the convenience of one phone, that's your call. Right, so they, uh, providing optionality to how you uh, implement your security policy is really important. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think that's the big thing. If you were to, this is this is the challenge. Um, um, most of security has been around trying to stop stuff from getting in, not understanding the two-way flow on the ins and the outs. And that's where it's that's really where it's changing, even to the point where um, you know when you think about um, uh, most uh, large companies will have over a thousand uh, apps, software as a service apps or cloud-based apps inside of their company, like a thousand. And some of those clouds talk to multiple clouds. How do you control behavior across multiple clouds when you don't even run the infrastructure? And so that's where human behavior is really important, right? Because at the end of the day, no matter how much infrastructure you outsource whether it's you know, uh, Workday or Salesforce.com or whatever it is, you still are paying your people, and it's still your data. And so that's why people and data are really the only two constants that companies in this new world of outsourced IT can focus on, because everything else they don't own, and they can't tell Amazon or Google or Facebook what to do. Right? And so um, uh, it, it's a, I think it's going to be a very interesting decade as far as you know, what's acceptable and not. And the, I think the, the good thing is, is that employees can always vote by leaving the company, right? And I think that's the ultimate ace up their sleeve and the ultimate one outside of any compliance and regulation issue that uh, the employers need to respect if they're going to get it right. So. Uh, well, I think as far as the mobile app, I think um, the we piloted as part of the team in privacy and information security at BYOD. So it was clear that once we were not connected to the server at work, any behavior on our phone was not tracked. So as soon as you left, whether it was lunch or six o'clock at night, your behavior at home wasn't monitored because so, you have a full 100% expectation of privacy in your own home or your own car. So I think that's where companies are going as far as that question. Would you repeat it? It was kind of like how VAPA is coming out for everybody for not checking personal data. Like if there was a work work force force violence situation like that was talking about where the lawyer was trying to run into that and shut that guy. This has now become a liability the entire company can see and react correctly. And then the government has step in and find you because you didn't act correctly either. Right. Well the good news is and the bad news, depending on the outcome, is it's not a black and white test, it's a reasonableness test. And so, like many, every reasonableness test, it's going to be very fact specific. So it's going to also depend on what other information they may have had about that person. If it was only that contained in the email, this person is agitated, that could be about me, you know, when, when <laughs> on certain, <At> lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> lunch, like, oh my God, do I understand this panel? But I mean, I think it really, <laughs> I think it really depends on the facts. So the reasonableness test is going to prevail until the legislators come out with very prescriptive steps that need to be taken. I'd like to thank the panelists, and it was a privilege being here. And thank you for coming out and listening. I hope, I hope this was uh, helpful. Thank you, everybody.